Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Bill Burns, the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I am delighted today to welcome Andrew Imbri back to Carnegie, at least virtually, uh, for the launch of his terrific new book, Power on the Precipice, The Six Choices America Faces in a Turbulent World. Um, all of you understand as well as I do that this is a moment of profound challenges for the United States. We face an increasingly complicated and competitive international landscape, no longer the singular dominant player that we once were. And the pandemic has exposed and accelerated problems on the domestic landscape too, from economic inequality to political polarization to systemic racism. In his new book, Andrew gives us an exceptional guide for navigating all of these challenges in foreign policy how to rebalance our military and diplomatic tools, how to make our alliances work better and manage rivals effectively, how to better connect foreign policy to domestic renewal. Andrew is an elegant writer, a talent I learned to admire in him as a colleague at the State Department and at Carnegie. The stories he tells to illustrate his wider points make this a particularly engaging and compelling read. Joining Andrew for today's discussion are Mira Rapp Hooper, another superstar of the next generation of policy thinkers and practitioners, and Ashley Tellis, a wonderful colleague at Carnegie whose wisdom about Central, about South Asia and American statecraft I've respected for decades. It's hard to imagine a more thoughtful group to help us understand America's role in a fast changing world or a better starting point than Andrew Embry's new book. I urge you to buy a copy or three if you haven't done so already, and you'll see a link on the screen to help you do just that. So thanks again for joining us, and let me turn things over to Ashley, who will moderate the conversation. Thanks again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for starting us off on such a fine note, and it's a pleasure to add to Bill's welcome a special, a special hello to Andrew and to Mira. Uh, it's great to have this conversation with the two of you. I thought since we can't presume that all our participants have read the book already, uh, we might give you, Andrew, a few minutes to sort of lay out its key themes, after which I want to bring Mira into the conversation and then we can have a three-way conversation among ourselves. So why don't I ask you, Andrew, to take the floor? Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here with all of you the three people I've learned so much from over the years. And I grew up as a, a foreign service brat. Uh, my father was a foreign service officer. And my father and Ambassador Burns actually served together in Jordan many years ago. And I was raised on stories of Bill Burns' exceptional diplomatic skill. And it was a real treat for me to start uh, at the State Department uh, in the second term of the Obama administration, actually get to see uh, Bill Burns' diplomatic skill up close. And one of the things that I learned when I was there and in reading his cables was that he brings to diplomacy, I think, an uncommon historical and literary sensibility, which I think allows him to see the power and possibilities of diplomacy, but also the limits of power tempered by human folly and to know where we can manage problems and where we can try to solve them. And so I've learned so much from him. Uh, I'm really grateful to, to share in this conversation as I am with, with you, Ashley, and with Mira, uh, two people I admire so much. And I, I hope one of the ideas we get to talk about today is the concept of power, which is, is so important, but also so nebulous and difficult to measure. And Ashley, I think you've been one of the most eloquent and sophisticated analysts of power uh, writing today. And so I've learned a great deal from you. And Mira, I think you've written one of the seminal books on power and practice, which is how we manage our network of alliances and how we adapt them. So for me, this is this is a humbling and wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So let me just say a few words to try to frame the discussion and share a little bit about what my book's about and why I wanted to write it. I'll just take you all back briefly to the fall of 2013. I was a speech writer and a member of the policy planning staff at the State Department. And our team of writers was helping then Secretary Kerry get ready for a big trip to the Asia Pacific. And it was going to be a lengthy trip and it was an important trip because it was about cementing President Obama's rebalance to the Asia Pacific. This was a multifaceted 
engagement to try to promote our economic engagement, our military, political, institutional engagement. Uh, and so it was really important. We were thinking about how to tell this story to the world. And in the middle of this trip, a crisis hit. And it wasn't a crisis emanating from overseas. It was a crisis at home, a self-inflicted wound. Our government shut down uh, because the Congress couldn't pass the budget. And President Obama had to cut his trip to Asia short, come back to Washington, D.C. to attend to the crisis. And Secretary Kerry uh, had a full plate while he was still there. And as speechwriters, we were really focused on how do we tell America's story to the world? And how does the world see America? And so I remember with our team, we scanned the headlines and a few really stood out that at the time. In the UK, one of the dailies said, and I quote, that the US was recklessly throwing away its future. In Germany, one of the dailies said, uh, and I quote, that we had done grave damage to our global reputation. And in South Korea, a key ally in the Asia Pacific, they urged America not to hold its citizens and the global economy hostage. And what we thought was interesting as writers was that these weren't aimed at one political party or another. They weren't about a particular poll or a politician. They were about America's credit and credibility in the world. Uh, and this drove home some really hard truths for me at the time and sparked my interest in this project, which is that our polarization at home and the way in which our foreign policy is weaponized for domestic political purposes undermines our power and position in the world and makes it very difficult to reach bipartisan agreement on tough foreign policy issues, which means we have wild swings from one administration to the next. It makes it even harder to come up with a sort of sensible approach to negotiations that isn't an all or nothing approach. It makes it hard to draw bipartisan lessons learned from our recent foreign policy successes and failures and I think it defers and delays real public sober debate about some of the foundational questions in US foreign policy. For example, should America be intervening in faraway lands? Where, when, and how should it employ force? How do we rebalance our national toolkit and shape a global economy in a way that promotes a strong, stable, and prosperous middle class, which is the foundation of our power in the world? Which allies are worth dying for? And how do we adapt our alliances to meet new threats that fall below the threshold of military conflict? How do we deal with, manage, and shape a deteriorating US-China relationship in a way that safeguards our values and interests, but doesn't court disaster or foreclose the opportunity to cooperate on major global problems? And what role for our values in foreign policy at a time when democracy seems to be on the back foot and nationalism and populism are surging and finally, what should we do with the great institutional heritage of the 20th century, the rules, norms, laws, and institutions that together comprise what we call the liberal international order? Should we reject it, reform it, reaffirm it? And these are all big generational defining questions. And I think at the end of the Cold War, we were poised for a debate about first principles in US foreign policy. But for a variety of reasons, I think that debate fell victim to a certain post-Cold War triumphalism that said that democracy and a certain brand of capitalism was destined to spread around the globe. And I think not everybody held this view and there were nuances and countercurrents to the public debate, but it was prevalent enough that I think it did induce a certain historical amnesia and a reluctance to grapple with new and emerging realities. And so that's what I tried to do in this book is lay out six big choices for America, six paths about whether and how it deploys military force, about its national security toolkit and investments, about its alliances, about its relationship to global order. How does it deal with strategic networks of corruption? How does it adapt? These are the questions that I try to wrestle with. And for each one, I tell a story of a leader who's wrestled with the trade-offs for each choice. Because I found in government, so many of these decisions are 51, 49 decisions. They're difficult and our public servants are doing their best to try to answer them. And I find that it's most compelling to try to see these questions through the eyes of a leader. And then I look back into history and I ask, have other countries been here before? Can we learn from them? And I try to apply lessons in each chapter for the choices that we face. And where I come down is America's decline is not inevitable, but the demand for wise US leadership is inescapable. And that's a real challenge for America today. We have to adapt to changing realities and compete more wisely. And the burning question for me is, you know, how do we do that with foresight, clarity of purpose and resolve? And I know I've learned so much from the other panelists today. So I'm really looking forward to a conversation with them and with, with all of you tuning in. 
Well, thank you, Andrew. It's, uh, that was a wonderful summation of the book. I want to congratulate you actually for writing the book that you did. Because, you know, at a moment where there are so many issues on the table, the temptation to sort of drill down on esoteric questions in microscopic detail, and there's a role for that, uh, is, is tempting. But you've written a book that essentially outlines broad macroscopic choices that the U.S. has to engage with respect to its role in the world. And so I want to bring you into this conversation along with Mira and all of you who are watching know Mira is the Schwarzman Fellow, the Senior Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, and is also a Senior Fellow at the Yale Law School's China Center. She's written extensively on these subjects before. So let me start with what I think is the two big premises that sort of underlie your analysis in the book. First, you start off by making the argument that we are essentially living in a post-dominant world, which you describe as the U.S. essentially being the first among unequals, right? Because there will be other powers of greater, of lesser magnitude in varying ways, but the U.S. still sort of stands alone. And yet it's not going to be an American-centered world. Uh, this is an argument that Bill Burns, in fact, made very clearly in the Atlantic piece that we were talking about before we started the program. Uh, this notion of a post-dominant world implies a certain conception of power and a certain conception of American power. So let me draw the two of you out. Are we really living in a post-dominant world if, by all measures of power, the United States still stands apart uh, from many of the rivals who would like to take its place. Andrew, if you could offer some thoughts and then I'd like Mira to jump in on that. Uh, thanks, Ashley. I think this is a central question to the, to the book. I would sort of, and I'd say, you know, I think our, our, I would say, I put it this way, that our margin of preeminence is not what it once was. And to try to understand that, I sort of took a net assessment approach. I think often it's easy to gather data on other countries or to point out their flaws, but we also have to look within and confront our own weaknesses and shore them up. We have to gather data on ourselves. One historian I think put this well, which is that decline is invisible from the inside. And so it requires real foresight and real investment in understanding the trade-offs. Now my approach uh, to power in the book looks at I think several different kinds of variables. The first is that I do think we need to think about the, the variable of time when we think about power. Too often we take snapshots of the current moment as opposed to looking at moving frames. And so I think understanding relative trends over time and a variety of indicators on capital investment, R&D, GDP, military spending is very important to get a more nuanced and textured sense of what power really means. The next is I think I try to look at resources, but even more than who has more resources and who has more of what. What are our institutional capabilities for converting those resources into political influence? And I think that's a critical notion of power that's too often underlooked. And it's also one that's been undermined greatly by our polarization at home. Another factor that's really important is the idea of scope and domain to get whom to do what. I think power is deeply situational and contextual. So in one sense, America's position looks quite good if you think about the aggregate figures or our position globally. But how do we look in critical regions in the South China Sea and in the Indo-Pacific? And I think that's really important to take into account. The other point I'd make is that it's really essential to, to go beyond just counting uh, resources. And I think we have to think about the intangibles of power, national morale, social and economic structures. Uh, these are much harder to measure, but I do think they have consequences for America's long-term power. And so to sum it up, I would just say, when I look at this in the book, where I come down is that America is a great power in relative decline, but with fundamental strengths. And China is a rising power with fundamental weaknesses. So it's a, it's a really complicated picture. Uh, but I think if we take this sort of nuanced net assessment approach, we have a good foundation for prescriptions. And I think the book does a really good job of sort of unpacking those facets. But I want to come back to you, Mira. Is the argument that Andrew just laid out persuasive uh, enough, particularly when we think about the future? I think the past record is quite clear that we have been declining in relative terms since at least 1945. But as one pushes this picture out into the out years, how does American power look to you? 
Well, first, Ashley, let me thank you for the question and the opportunity to be in conversation with you today. I so admire and respect your work, as you know, and this is a real treat. And Andrew, congratulations on an absolutely phenomenal book. Um, for those who haven't picked it up yet, I think Andrew's introduction told you everything you need to know about this book. He is an incredible storyteller, an incredibly compelling writer, and a thoughtful scholar. Um, so I really can't recommend it enough. And you see it over my shoulder right here. Um, but to dive in to this question about power, I do find Andrew's argument very compelling. The way I would probably frame it in my own terms, which I think is not dissimilar, is that we are past the period of American primacy. Um, that is to say, it is no longer appropriate to argue that the United States has uncontested dominance across the military, political, and economic spheres. That was, of course, the position that we enjoyed in the post-Cold War world for at least two decades, if not more. Um, but it has largely been usurped and contested by China because of China's explosive economic growth, its breakneck investments in the military sphere, and its increasing political influence in Asia and beyond. But that all spells a picture that, as Ashley mentioned, is one of relative decline. That is to say that we are relatively less powerful with respect to China and in Asia than we once were, but actually we remain absolutely quite powerful by many metrics. Beyond some of the ones that Andrew mentioned, the United States remains incredibly wealthy in GDP per capita terms. It continues to have a really extraordinary innovative base, albeit one that needs quite a bit of tending, as Andrew aptly lays out in his book. And if we keep our immigration policies sound, it can have demographic metrics that are highly favorable for decades to come. So this is all to say that it's possible that we acknowledge that the United States is in some amount of relative decline, but still say this is a relatively advantageous picture. If I were to speak on behalf of the United States, I would not want to trade power positions with most other great powers in history. So I think fundamentally, both Andrew and I see this picture of relative decline as one that is still lined with a fair amount of optimism. And that's part of what makes Andrew's book and his explication of power so nuanced. Indeed, he emphasizes the fact that this relative decline is contingent, meaning it's highly dependent on American choices. And that's why the rest of his book is so important. Uh, thank you, Mira. I like the distinction between absolute and relative power, and I'm glad, Andrew, that you made it really early on in the book, lest people sort of accuse you of, you know, declinism, which unfortunately has also become, uh, you know, politically laden form of, of discourse in the country. But let me come back to the question of relative power and American prospects and try and sort of peel apart some of the issues that are implicated there. It seems to me that part of our relative decline uh, over the last 70 odd years has been because of mistakes that we've made along the way. And those mistakes, you know, to a lesser or greater degree can be corrected. And to the degree we can avoid them, of course, the counsel to avoid them is always sensible. But there is a structural reason, it seems to me, that relative decline has come about. And that is because of the success of our own capacity in building an open order, which allows others to thrive, right? So the great success stories that we are worrying about now, China, East Asia, have really sort of arisen because the United States built an open order and continues to pay the price of maintaining it. So in some sense, I'm trying to push you to address what I think of as, you know, the hegemon's curse. It builds an order in order to sort of serve its interests, but the openness of the order then creates competitors. So the question to my mind then becomes, isn't this now a debate about whether we should continue to maintain openness versus a moving in some other direction that may serve our personal interests or our individual interests, but not necessarily enhance the collective good? How do you address this question, which seems to me to be the core of your book? I think this tension is really fascinating that you identify. This is the way I would put it. I think 
our role in the post-war period wasn't to keep our allies and partners and friends down. It was to lift them up and we welcomed their rise. We welcomed the creation of new markets and new partners. I think the bargains we struck at the time really reflected that. In a way, we had a sort of realist hard power bargain that allowed us to exercise hegemony, which I think is a combination of power and legitimacy, not just brute force, but allowed us to exercise this power with purpose and in a sustainable way, lowering the cost for us in terms of, of spearheading our global leadership. At the same time, I think there was also a liberal bargain about trying to bind ourselves to certain rules and institutions in a way that would give our allies a voice and a vote. And so I think this sort of notion of that we created an open world is precisely the goal of our, of our foreign policy. And I would sort of, I would say it this way, that I think American power is in some sense inseparable from the global order that it promoted. Uh, at times, you know, the liberal order is hard to sort of grapple with, but I think it's made up of a couple key components of institutions, of norms and values of interdependence, but also supported by American power. So I think the issue of America's relative decline really has to be part of this debate about the sustainability of the liberal order and whether we'll see institutional change and reform within it or a new order altogether. I would say a few other things, which is that I do think our, our power and purpose is inseparable from the fate of liberal values and free and open societies, which is why I think this question matters so deeply. I think the challenge that I see in terms of political dynamics is that there's this unhelpful sort of political conundrum where we always tend to have an election where the incumbent says that he or she has rescued the country from inevitable decline. And the challenger says that we've fallen back in. And it sort of creates a confusing picture, which is why, and we, I think we can talk about this separately, why I think having good strategic planning and assessments and having a clear public debate that audits our power and gives the public a better sense of where we are is so important. Uh, the last thing I would just say in terms of the hegemon's dilemma is that I do think there are different set of policy prescriptions that attach to whether you think decline is reversible or whether you think it's inevitable. Uh, and we can we can get into that. I think there's some good historical examples, but that's why I try to, to push the, I, my view is that this is a fundamentally optimistic book in the sense that I think our choices really do matter. We face forces beyond our control, but they don't determine our responses. And that's why I think the construct of choice and the leadership that we need is so important for America's power in the world. And I think that is inherent in the notion of contingent decline, right? That there's nothing inevitable about it and that we do have capacities. And as Mira pointed out, the fact that we have these extraordinary resources actually should spur us to make the smart choices going forward. But Mira, have you've written about alliances and you've written about the challenges we face in terms of defending others and the impact that has on our own prospects. How do you come to the question of the hegemon's dilemma? Yeah, Ashley, this is a brilliant question. Um, and I think you've, you've really coined a term here uh, that is so useful for all of us. Um, Andrew and I actually have a lot in common in the way that we think about uh, this question of openness and closure in the international system. Um, and I have a new book coming out next week with a co-author, Rebecca Listener, that's actually entitled An Open World, um, that speaks to exactly this issue. Um, we argue that essentially the choice facing the United States is whether or not we will adopt a strategy that aims to keep the world open, even though we are past our period of dominance, and we lay out a strategy for how to do so. And there are a lot of echoes in our argument um, in this brilliant book that Andrew has written. Um, what I will note is that I think you're absolutely right, Ashley, that there is an embedded, uh, embedded dilemma that faces all hegemons who set up an international order that is inherently connected to their power and nevertheless welcomes others and ushers in shared benefits and shared cooperation. Necessarily, um, as others get empowered, increasingly um, those who may not share democratic norms or political systems, you invite challenges inside the system as opposed to without it. Uh, in prior eras, certainly where there was less international governance, we generally thought of great power clashes over international order happening through conflict when a hegemon rose and sought to challenge the existing international order from without because that order no longer reflected the distribution of power and benefits. But what we're seeing now, I think, in the international system is actually a product of its success, which is embedded in your idea of a hegemon's dilemma 
dilemma. That is that by virtue of the fact that this international order actually did raise most votes, albeit with unequal gains for people inside of their states, it created the opportunity for a country like China to rise from within and not to challenge the United States necessarily in military terms, although there are military challenges there, but to rise up as it, through a contestation within the international order. Um, so I think it's important to note, as Andrew does, that this is a fairly unique set of challenges that we are facing in this era. While we have certainly seen great power contests before, including over the rules and norms that will govern the international system, the extent to which both of these great powers lie inside of that system is really quite novel and in, and in many ways is a product of that system's success. So when we talk about this debate over openness and closure, what we're really talking about is whether the United States and like-minded allies and partners are going to succeed in keeping the international system open in the principles, rules, and norms that govern it, or whether authoritarian competitors, including China, Russia, and others, will succeed in hiving off pieces of their regions, information spaces, and other functional areas, and even liberal values like human rights. So I do think this is sort of the terms of the contest of our time and one that is truly quite novel in history in a lot of ways. So let me follow up with uh, a thought. It seems to me that if the challenge is to maintain an open system, one, because it's our legacy to the world, it's served our interests, even if in the process it's raised others up. There are two ways in which we can protect our interests here in keeping the system going. One is to reduce the costs that the system imposes on us to ourselves, right? And this is where all the debates about burden sharing sort of pop up, which is the US is doing too much, others are benefiting, it's time for them to uh, sort of pay their fair share. I want your thoughts on this issue, but there is also a flip side, which is as you uh, attempt to reduce costs to yourself, are there things that you can do to stimulate sort of supernormal growth uh, within the United States so that the costs we bear actually become bearable over time. And it seems to me that the solution eventually will be found through some combination of the two. So Andrew, if you could start sort of, you know, taking your conception and sort of answering a very practical policy question, which is what priority should the United States now pay to issues of burden sharing? as a way of getting others to chip in, in maintaining this open system that we all agree has sort of served our interests? Well, I think I'd start with a, a notion that we used to do quite well, but we have lost, I think recently in our economic and national security statecraft, which is bringing together our foreign policy and our domestic policy and creating a shared purpose for democracy on, on inequality, on climate, on issues that speak to the concerns of allies around the world. I think one of the mistakes we made is forgetting that for foreign policy to be successful, it has to be sustainable and has to enjoy broad domestic support. So to your, to your very good point, Ashley, I think we need at home a resilience and innovation agenda. I think government used to have a role in shaping and spurring markets, not just in fixing market failures. And so I think at home to have a sort of 21st century version of Vannevar Bush's uh, multifaceted innovation effort after the post-war period, where we realized science helped win the war with penicillin and radar. And so we decided we needed to invest broadly in research and development. We needed to attract the best talent from around the world. We needed allies for markets, but also for good ideas and sharing best practices. And we have an incredibly diverse and dynamic innovation ecosystem at home that does, as Mir wisely said, needs tending. But I think if we combine government with industry, philanthropy, and the laboratories of democracy at the state and local levels, we could, we could strengthen our hand for the long term in terms of bolstering our productive capacity, which for me underpins our long term military power. I think this is the foundation for a, a wise approach. In terms of the specific question on burden sharing with allies, I think 2% of defense spending is a, is a common metric and it's often at the heart of disputes with allies. I think it's distracted us from a much more important purpose, which is how do we make sure we have compatible capabilities and that we're working together effectively on shared challenges. I mean, in some ways, 
the burden sharing dilemma that we have was built into the system because we wanted allies to underbuild their militaries so that they didn't engage in arms races and create another conflagration on the European continent. So that's a that's a difficult and delicate challenge. I would just say one last thing, which is that I, I thought Mira's point was really excellent about, and your point on the hegemon's dilemma, that I do think you know China sort of grew up in the system that we created. Uh, but looking back on that, and now we're at a time when we're questioning our assumptions and received verities in new ways, I think we have to be careful not to push our insights too far and think, well, engagement didn't work, and then so containment has to be the only option. I think we're stuck sometimes between polarities. And to me, a sort of wiser middle ground approach is a shaping strategy. I think Ambassador Burns has made this point eloquently that instead of trying to shape China's internal trajectory, over which I don't think we have much leverage and is unlikely to be successful, I think we try to shape the environment into which it rises. And there's a whole range of tools that we have building on our strengths that we talked about before to develop new partnerships with allies, including with India in the region, shaping rules, norms, and standards for new technologies, forging high, high standard trade agreements that support our middle class at home. So all of these issues are interconnected, but I do think it goes back to your point, Ashley, about building a strong innovation base and a strong economy so that we can project outward sustainably. Mira, do you want to jump in on the burden sharing question? Because that I suspect is not going away anytime soon. And is sort of tempting for people to latch on to because it appears to at least solve uh, the question of, you know, the U.S. overinvesting in producing collective goods to the neglect of goods that matter to itself. Absolutely, Ashley. I think it's a critical question and you're right, it's not going away. My short answer is that I actually do think it's reasonable for the United States to want to sort of right the burden sharing balance within its alliances and with its allies. Um, but there is a looming question of how it does this. And Andrew lays out a dichotomy for us in his book between coercion and persuasion. Um, and I think that it's incredibly necessary that to the extent that we need to have these burden sharing debates, which I think we do, they be done through persuasion and not through coercion. Because if they ultimately come at the expense of the alliances themselves, the United States will have effectively cut off its nose to spite its face. That is to say, if we agree we're in a post-dominant world and the United States breaks its alliances in the interest of trying to make them more productive and more equal, it will find itself paying more in blood, treasure, and political costs down the road. Now, to give a little bit more background, Andrew is exactly right. The question of asymmetric spending between the US and its allies was actually built into the system itself. The United States preferred to spend more on defense during the old early Cold War period because that gave it more leverage over its allies. But of course, in the decades since, most American allies have become consolidated democracies, prospering economies in their own right, and many are scientifically and technologically capable. We need only look at responses to the COVID crisis to know that American allies from Germany to South Korea are amongst the best responders on the globe. Um, in many ways, exactly the countries we should want to be allied with if we got to choose today. Um, but that also means that they're probably capable of doing more than they were able to do in the years immediately following the Second World War. I think the solution to this, however, is not to simply foot stomp the need for all allies to spend 2% of um, their GDP on defense, although I do think that remains a reasonable goal, but to acknowledge that many of the shared challenges we face in the 21st century are not military challenges at all. That is, by focusing on this 2% of GDP number, we're uh, sort of excusing ourselves from the fact that many of our dearest threats come in cyberspace, in the form of maritime coercion, and in the form of climate change and global health crises. So what I would like to see us do is tackle these burden sharing debates from within our alliances and increasingly broaden the way we calculate burden sharing amongst allies to include this far broader range of contributions to the national defense. Because I think if we do that, we'll actually find our allies increasingly able to contribute in areas where we all have shared goals. It, this is, I, I share completely the analysis and even the arguments, but it seems to me that there is a consequence that falls out of that argument. And that is the United States will not have the luxury always of pursuing its own preferences 
if those preferences compete with the preferences of its friends. One of the great advantages, Mira, as you pointed out, was that the inequality baked into our alliance system gave us freedom of maneuver. We could do what we wanted because we were bearing the costs. If Andrew is right, that relative decline is going to take a toll, then one of the tolls it takes is on your freedom of maneuver. You don't have that space because you don't have those relative capabilities, at least in a differential form. Do you both see the United States at this juncture in its history willing to think of its role as leading and defending a liberal consensus as opposed to simply pursuing its own private, in quotation marks, preferences? Because if that transition is not made, then the arguments that you all are making for thinking of burden sharing and accommodating burden sharing in a more enlightened way is not going to have much traction. What is your judgment of the state of the United States on this question going forward? Well, Mayor, I'll jump in. I mean, I think it's, uh, to me, I think you said it, which is that we have to try to shift from a strategy of dominance to a strategy of leadership that harnesses our broad network of allies and partners. Uh, and this is, at times we've done this very well. And I think at a time when our margin for error is shrinking and our resource constraints are tightening, we can't wish away trade-offs or spend our opponents into oblivion or try to dominate everywhere at all times. And I think at some points we're gonna have to realize that our allies have interests and aspirations of their own. They want choices, but we can try and empower those choices that meet our shared values and interests. And so I think some of this is trying to support allies on issues that matter to them and to us, like, like health challenges, like crisis prevention, like climate change, like interstate and interstate st instability, but allowing them to build a less, for example, in Asia, a less China-centric regional order that has a, a different kind of equilibrium, but it will require a different approach. I think going back to our, our best traditions in statecraft, which is common problem solving and enlightened self-interest, realizing that our broad network of allies really are net assets, not liabilities. You know, one of the one of the stories I tell in my book is the alliance diplomacy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And one of their famous uh, statesmen was uh, this, this gentleman named Kautznitz, and he talked about the extreme cost of alliances that they were not to exist for the Habsburg Empire, but the, ext the extraordinary benefits if they were there. And sometimes I think we don't tell the story enough about what our allies have done for us in the world. We sort of lose that historical consciousness that Mira tells so well in her book. Uh, and so I think we have to also think about the home front again and effectively telling that narrative and that story, not just on election day, but consistently so that we have that domestic consensus to lead a network of allies and partners and to empower them to promote the, the common interest among democracies. Like, and I just sort of sum it up as you know, more resilience at home and greater solidarity with democracies in the world. Mira, go ahead. I want to come back to another uh, issue that was raised earlier, but please, please respond to this. Go ahead. I'll just be very brief, Ashley. I think it's a superb question. Um, and what part of what you're pointing to is the fact that if the United States is to sort of take more of a position of leading from within, this in many ways produces a bi-directional friction in the system. Um, on the one hand, we'll see less of the United States just sort of charging ahead, setting policy and expecting allies to follow. And in some cases, you may see allies disappointed because Washington is not doing something that they would like to see it do. I think we could point to some areas in the Obama administration where this was true. The Obama administration was initially not excited about getting militarily involved in Libya and then felt like NATO allies really pushed it in that direction in a lot of ways. But I think we'll also see that friction come in the form of allies and partners themselves being loath to take the types of positions that the United States might like them to take. Of course, Ashley, you and I are all too familiar with the fact that allies and partners have a very broad range of views on China and often do not want to be forced to choose. And even when they feel strongly that Beijing is taking action that is antithetical to their interests, do not want to be the ones to stick their necks out. So in many ways, if the United States does pursue a strategy like this one, where it is leading from within, 
it will be asking allies to make a far harder set of choices than they have been asked to make in the last four years or so when the United States was in many ways acting unilaterally. So I think we are yet to see whether this can work and how it will work. Um, but that if it does, there will be this new sort of push and pull in the system that has to be negotiated and necessarily is new for all of us in some ways. I'm glad you raised this issue because it's it gives me an opening to address something that Andrew has written about, you know, very cogently in the book, which is the struggle between the core and the periphery uh, and it, their relative demands on U.S. attention. One of the consequences, it seems to me, of sort of doubling down on alliances is that the core periphery distinction actually gets more complicated because Peripheries for our allies would be very different from peripheries for the United States. Mm -hmm. So what happens in North Africa is completely peripheral to the United States because of our position. It's not peripheral for the alliance. And so in practical terms, you're going to end up having to make very complex trade-offs. So even though in theory, we all agree we should re resource you know, the core and you know, be smart about sort of overinvestments in the periphery, how do we manage this in an alliance context? Because this then feeds into another dynamic that, Andrew, you flag in the book, which is the perpetual temptation uh, between entrapment and abandonment. So if the United States begins to tell allies that your peripheries are less interesting to me and therefore will go unsupported, what does this do to the robustness of the alliances that we want to protect? Hmm. This is a difficult, really difficult topic. I think you know, my sense is that if you look at the historical record, the periphery always tempts a great power. And I think our capacity for underestimating how costly that temptation can be if we act on it, it is so common in the historical record. The dilemma that I face when I try to analyze this problem is that there are times when if you leave the periphery unattended, uh, it can fester, it can draw in other powers, they can gain advantage. Problems can arise that end up hurting you and your homeland. And as you said so well, I think allies have a different perception of what counts as the core and what counts as the periphery. And so these are really difficult trade-offs and tensions to manage. I mean, my, my sense from looking at the historical record is that we're best when we, not when we ever contemplate military force, because sometimes it's necessary, but when we reach for the military tool first, we, I think, give up some leverage that diplomacy, development, and development finance can give us with our allies and partners to attend to the root causes of some of the instability that we see in the periphery, whether that's through anti-corruption policies and governance measures or education. I think, you know, you know providing uh, more, more empowerment for women and education investments uh, and resilience against climate can do much more to sort of attend to the, these forms of instability. But when they do arise and you have to confront them, I think there is in some sense evolving a division of labor, thinking about where allied interests are and whether they can smartly attend to certain problems in the periphery, for example, some of France's actions in North Africa, and we're providing the enablers. But then we're concentrating on questions that meet our comparative advantages and capabilities. I think that requires a common intelligence picture. And as Mira put it, I think we do need to lead with our persuasive capabilities to try to understand through strategic foresight, through strategic planning, where these challenges are going to arise, how the division of labor might work, and how we can think more creatively about how to pull the best from our allies, because they are going to need to do more. But I think our allies do have comparative advantages in a variety of ways, comparative local knowledge, local forces. I think we can be much more creative about how we leverage our alliances and also how to think long term so that we're helping facilitate alignment in new ways. I think we have a, a wonderful tradition of working with our core allies and partners, but there's so much potential elsewhere in Southeast Asia, in India, in Latin America that we don't talk about enough. And I think there are important connections and cooperative frameworks that we can think about for our allies to help meet these challenges in different areas of the periphery where our vital interests might not be at stake. And I think, I think the way to thread the needle is exactly the way you outlined it, which is we've got to think of non-military ways uh, that allow us to do things so that it sort of mitigates the tension that may arise between core and periphery you know, for us and for our allies. I want to go back to an issue that was raised earlier and that had to do with how does the United States stimulate supernormal growth in order to be able to equalize the burdens or to minimize the burdens in a different way. 
And you mentioned the great importance on sort of dominating the cycles of innovation, because that's really what provides, you know, American advantage. Uh, you flag in the book wonderfully uh, the diminishing role of the federal government uh, in stimulating uh, investments in R&D. And to my mind, that is a case of market failure, actually, because private sector does not, the private sector does not invest in R&D because its time horizons are too short. And they think of it essentially as sort of basic research, which won't pay off in terms of shareholder value. But what are the limits to which you're willing to go with respect to federal intervention? Because I can see, you know, people using this argument as the tip of the sphere to then move into greater federal intervention like industrial policy and so on and so forth. So do you see the role of the federal government as sort of having appropriate breaks, uh, even as it intervenes in order to make the economy more efficient and, and sort of enhance its long-term prospects? Ashley, if I may, I'd love to jump in with just a second point on your question to Andrew, um, because Andrew is so thoughtful in this area. Uh, he's written elsewhere about the importance of alliances moving into new technological spaces. Um, and so sort of dovetailing with Ashley's question on the domestic front about federal investments in R&D and where we draw the lines, how should we think about alliances in the context of pooled collaboration towards new technologies? In many ways, these alliance structures don't overlap with our traditional alliances. They're not purely NATO or purely in Asia. They involve a perspective melange of countries, some countries who aren't even necessarily treaty allies, and an unprecedented level of private public cooperation. Um, so I wonder if in addition to giving us your lay of the land on the domestic picture, you could say a little bit more about what tech alliances look like in your conception. Oh, these are these are really rich debates. I you know I think all right starting on the home front I do think government has an incredibly important role in investing in areas where the private sector is unlikely to go but where the public really cares about ethics, safety, privacy, security uh, investments that push the curve of discovery without immediate benefits but with potential application down the road. So I see the role of government as a catalyzer as a convener I think we've we've really, uh, in terms of a percentage of GDP, our investments in R and D have really declined, and it's so important to invest for the long term in an interdisciplinary fashion across the government, not just in one area, because so many of the investments end up bearing fruit down the road. And so I do think the government's role in investing in what's called infra technologies, technologies that enable innovation across sectors, and for government to create timelines of urgency to meet national security challenges is critical. I think the global picture and the domestic picture has really changed on R&D. You know, in the, during the Cold War, the private sector was about a third of R&D and the government was two thirds. That's flipped. And globally, you know, we used to account for upwards of 70 percent of, of global R&D. And today we're about 20, 25 percent. So the picture is really different. And I think it does illustrate the sort of shifting power dynamics that we've been talking about. So I think it means we need an innovation agenda at home that recognizes that government can be an effective catalyst for innovation, a shaper and a convener, not just a corrector of market failure. And I think right now, given the extreme domestic inequalities at home and a polarization that in part is driven by these social and economic inequities, I think there's a real argument to be made that government-wide mission initiatives could really help spur this kind of growth and provide strategic direction for the country. Uh, and I do think our dynamic system where if philanthropies and industry and state and local governments are involved, we can try to ensure that those traditions and those actors help keep the system dynamic and not get too top heavy. And I do think that's a question of not, say, mimicking our competitors in China, but staying true to our own model and revitalizing its purpose. Now, I think Mira's point about technology alliances is so critical. I think one of the big debates is, you know, do we have the kinds of structures we need right now to focus on alliance, technology alliances, or do we need to create new ones? There's always a cost benefit. I think creating new alliances has its own costs, can distract from other uh, organizations and can create tensions over membership. But there's been some really creative thinking I I've seen coming from CNAS and other organizations and CSET, my own organization, about how to think about technology alliances. You know, Right now, the United States and its allies comprise two thirds of global R&D. Uh, and that's an extraordinary pool that we could try to use to invest more effectively together. If we had a horizon scanning capability to see where the gaps are, 
how we can bring them together. I think too often we see US-China relations in a binary context, and we forget to see the broader picture, which is that we have an enormous comparative advantage with our allies. So I just close with this. I think in terms of power, we might think about new geometries and geographies of power. And what I mean by that is that there are many more actors involved in innovation. So our alliances are gonna have to look a little different than just purely state to state level. And there's also new geographies of power. And you know, one of the most important resources that's become strategic today are semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And that's a key node in the computing power supply chain. That's spread out in different countries, mostly in Japan, the Netherlands, and the United States. So that's an interesting coalition of countries to try to work together on this issue. And I think if you go across the board on key technologies, the cluster of partners you're gonna want might vary. And my, my sense is that we need to have agile alliances in these discrete technology areas, whether they're flexible or more formal, I think is something to be decided. But we really do have a chance to leverage this extraordinary asset uh, to stimulate long-term growth, which again, I think is so important for our military power uh, but also for our, our standing and reputation in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love to love this conversation, conversation on the forever. But I'm mindful of an audience outside of the three of us. And so if you don't mind, Andrew and Mira, I'm going to uh, recognize a few questions and give you a chance to take a crack at it. The first is from Fiona on YouTube, who, and this is going to tax your skills as a seer, uh, who asks, what foreign policy stances do you think the world can expect from a second Trump administration or a first Biden administration, depending on who takes office in January? I'll, I'll take a shot, Mira, if you want to jump in. The, the first I would say is, you know, We've, we've seen uh, you know, President Trump's foreign policy over the last couple of years. And I think if, if the president were reelected, well, we can expect more of the same, but also a deepening and acceleration in some areas. So there's been a deep skepticism uh, in the administration on alliances, uh, on trade agreements. Uh, there's been you know, less of a focus on democratic values. And I think there's been more emphasis on reciprocity, more emphasis on bilateralism as opposed to multilateralism, uh, and more emphasis on, on sort of the kinds of metrics like manufacturing power uh, at home. And so I think we'll likely see more of those, but I also fear that we will also see enormous pressure on our alliances, uh, enormous pressure on other multilateral institutions, uh, and, and pressure on where we have our, our true presence overseas and how we sustain that and whether we withdraw them. And I think you know, these are these are critical issues and our allies are not going to wait around and they may very well uh, think about other alternatives. And once path dependencies start to kick in in the policymaking process, sometimes they are hard to reverse. And so I think there's a set of choices at stake right now about the order that we've built, about the alliances that we've constructed and led for so many years. It will be very much at stake uh, in the next, if it, there's another Trump administration. Uh, in terms of a Biden administration, I certainly... I can't speak for the campaign, but my sense is that you'd see a much greater emphasis on bringing together foreign policy and domestic policy on economic statecraft and national security. You'd see an approach that puts an emphasis on climate that tries to deal with inequality through international trade agreements. And I think Carnegie has been at the cutting edge of thinking about a foreign policy for the middle class. And I think you'd start to see trade agreements that include a broader array of interests uh, not just the big multinationals, but also smaller companies. Uh, and I also think we'd have a reinvigoration of our alliances globally in a sense that as America's power is in margin of preeminence is not what it once was, that we will need to lead by, with, and through our allies. And I think you could see a reimagining of our allies in a whole host of areas, and then a return to putting values you know, front and center in our foreign policy, where democracies really need to be more resilient uh, and need to stick together to set the rules of the road for the 21st century. So I think those are sort of some broad contours that I'd see, but you know, especially in light of COVID, in light of the fog of crisis right now, uh, the variables are really uncertain. And so uh, there's a lot, to, a lot to head and big choices that we have to face. Well, I'm gonna direct the next question at Mira because I think you're perfectly positioned to answer this. Can you provide specific examples of how the US roles in various alliances differ? Uh, or, and how they differ from region to region. So anything that contrasts uh, the role that the U.S. plays in its various alliances. 
Sure, um, and thanks for a great question. I'll try to answer this one um, with a bit of a story on how the US Alliance system came to be, because I think that actually tells you a lot about the differences in the Alliance systems in Europe and Asia. Um, contrary to sort of popular lore that this was a system foisted upon the world by a dominant United States in the wake of World War II, it was actually the product of demand signals um, from both Europe and Asia as war-torn allies sought to provide for their own security and as the Cold War appeared to start to seize both regions. In the case of Europe, a group of European countries came to the United States wanting to form something called the Brussels Pact, which would be a multilateral arrangement, and they asked Washington to provide a security guarantee to support them. Now, at the time, the Truman administration couldn't take them up on it because it was an election year and it seemed too risky. But this request ultimately led to the formation of the Atlantic Alliance one year later. Um, and the reason why this is important is because it tells you why the United States has a multilateral guarantee to Europe. That is to say, European countries themselves decided to bind their own security fates together, seeing the front lines of the Cold War with the Soviet Union as falling between East and West and wanted to, for a time, depend on American air power and nuclear weapons to back up their security. So that's why today we have a multilateral NATO with 30 members in it and a set of interlocking institutions. In Asia, however, the demand signals looked quite different. American pacts were formed in two different periods, one right after the formal end of the Pacific War when the United States first formed its alliances with Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the Philippines, and a second period of alliance formation after the Korean War and the French fall at Dien Bien Phu. And there we saw our alliance with Korea, with Taiwan, and the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. The reason those alliances are not, in fact, knit into one multilateral pact is because for a long time, allies in Asia were still worried about Japan, who had been a wartime adversary. And each of them saw a different adversary inside of Asia as being most relevant to them. Depending on the country, they were most concerned with the Soviet Union, with North Korea, or with the People's Republic of China. So as a result, you've seen entirely different alliance structures sort of grow up in this bilateral system of pacts in Asia versus those in NATO. You've seen different mission sets focused on different adversaries, depending on who we're talking about. And you see huge differences in the extent to which allies cooperate with one another. That said, I think in many ways their interests are converging in the 21st century. We see more concern across regions with China, with new technology, with climate change and global health. So I am hopeful that these distinctions will continue to erode in many ways over time. I'm mindful of the time and the fact that we have about five minutes left in our program. And I have two questions which I think are important to answer. So I'm going to direct one to Andrew and then one to Mira. The one to Andrew is how do you see the relationship between domestic disturbances in the United States and the impact on our foreign policy, including our influence abroad? And the one to Mira, I think, I mean, Andrew could answer this too, but I want to get Mira into this uh, conversation. Do you see the US now being on the cusp of retrenching from some of its extended obligations mm -hmm. as other great powers did in the past. And what do you see as the future of US power? Are you optimistic? Uh, does it require retrenchment? And so on and so forth. So Andrew, I'll start with you on the relationship between our domestic circumstances and our image and capacities abroad. Well, I, I'm, so, I'm actually so glad that the, this question was posed because one of the challenges that I have and one of the conversations that I always uh, have with people when they talk about my book is, you know, are you optimistic about the prospects of the country? You've studied the rise and fall of nations. You know, where will America go? Do you find any cause for sort of a weathered hope about this? And I, I see the stirrings in the country for racial justice and equality as extremely hopeful and connecting with the best of our traditions in terms of people willing to, to fight and strive for enlarging the definition of we the people. And this has always been a tradition in our country where it's never been inevitable and nothing's guaranteed. And I think this is why sort of fateful choices to me is a recurring theme in our history. And I remember, you know, I think everybody is mourning the loss of Congressman John Lewis, the late John Lewis. And he wrote something I think was very profound and expressed this sentiment. He said, democracy is not a state, it's an act. 
And to me, I think I, you know, I couldn't hope to try to sum up the message I was trying to convey in my book better than that line, which is that democracy is not a birthright. It's really something we have to prove with every generation through our choices. And so to me, I see what's happening in the country right now, despite all the hurt going through our communities, as a striving for what America might be, even as people see it as it is. And I still have a hope in the country for its capacity for reform and corrective action. And my sense is that if we sort of see the issues clear-eyed, perceive our strengths and weaknesses, and really put in the hard work of citizenship, uh, we can have a more promising future for the country. And so to me, I, I only come away with a with an optimism about what we're seeing and the hope that we can reach a better place. Thank you, Andrew. Mia? That was beautifully put. Um, you know, Ashley, I think it would be hard to deny that the United States appears to have been retrenching over the last several years, disengaging from many international commitments that matter deeply to our allies, whether the Iran nuclear deal or the Paris Climate Accords. Indeed, if you ask our allies what actions by the United States are most damaging to our credibility, it is those disengagements from multilateral regimes, as opposed to any particular action we take bilaterally. Um, but I don't think this is a wise strategy. Indeed, if you believe, as we do, that we are living in something of a post-dominant world, the smartest strategy a hegemon who hopes to hold on could take would be to increasingly lean into cooperative arrangements that allow it, allow it to defray costs and share burdens uh, by maximizing cooperation. That includes alliances that we've been talking about, but it also includes international institutions. Uh, but I wanna conclude on a point that you make, Ashley, in an essay that you wrote so brilliantly shortly after COVID reached American shores. For anyone who hasn't read it, Ashley published one of the best pieces I read about the COVID crisis um, in NBR. And he noted that we were not only experiencing a problem of relative decline, but a problem of state capacity. And I think this is so important to understanding the moment that we're living in. There is no question that American power is more contested than it has been in the past, and that we are facing so many of the hard choices that Andrew has helped us to navigate so deftly in this book. But there's also a question of whether the United States can recover its own state competence to fully make good on the extraordinary resources that it still has at its disposal. If we can do that, I actually think we're all quite optimistic about the road ahead, but whether or not we can is, of course, an open question. Thank you, Mira. That actually ties nicely to the theme that Andrew started out with, which is state capacity as linked to the capacity to transform what may be latent resources into outputs that actually buy you uh, power and influence in the international system. Uh, I want to just take this opportunity to uh, thank all those of our participants who have joined us in all the various media formats. The diversity of them actually simply boggles the mind, but it's wonderful that we can connect in these difficult times uh, in this form. And I want to take a very uh, special time out to thank Andrew and Mira for being with us today. Uh, Andrew, I wish you all the best for the book. Uh, your timing is exquisite. Uh, I hope it contributes to the debate about our own future. And Mira, I wish you all the best in your book that is coming forward, because the whole question of how we relate to the world with our friends, I think is going to become even more important uh, in the months and the years ahead. Uh, so thank you all, both of you uh, very much, and all of you who are online for having joined us this morning. Bye-bye. Thank you. Pleasure.